the heart of our faith, we find strength. In the whispers of our prayers, we discover hope. Today, let us come together as one to embrace the light of love, the beauty of grace, and our unwavering faith. In the warmth of these walls, we find refuge. In the unity of our congregation, we find belonging. We are bound not only by our shared beliefs, but by the love and compassion that flow through these chairs. Let us be the hands that reach out to those in need and the voice of compassion for those in despair. Let our lives be a testament to the power of faith and the overwhelming grace of God. Let us be the light that shines in the darkness, the hands that lift the fallen, and the voice of hope to a world in need. In our faith, we find our calling. In our church, we find our family. And in our service, we find our purpose. May the love and grace of our Lord guide us together on life's journey. Good morning. As Gary said, my name is Daphne Johnston, and I'm the founder of the Respite for All Foundation. I also started our respite ministry in Montgomery, Alabama, close to 12 years ago this April now. And I cannot wait to share with you some of the stories and the wisdom and just the faith journey that we've been on to grow this ministry across the country. Uh, we started in the basement of our church in Montgomery with two participants living with dementia and 14 volunteers. And as I told the earlier services, we were in the basement with no windows in the, uh, no light in the windows, coffee stains on the carpet. That was the only space we had. And out of that, that small group of people, uh, we grew from two days a week to three days a week to four days a week, took over a wing, moved upstairs, helped churches start across Alabama, and now Washington, Kansas, Wisconsin, New York, all down through the Southeast. And I think you guys are number six in the state of Florida. God is behind this ministry. There is energy and there is passion and there's, most of all, there's a need. So I'm so, so thankful uh, that your church leadership had the follow through to see a vision. It is remarkable for a church to start new ministries, food pantries, children's ministries, uh, dementia ministries. There is a need and your church has chosen to do this and I'm, I'm just so grateful to the whole team. You know, if I had to do it over again, I would probably pick another word besides respite because I didn't know what that word was. I was 15 years in long-term care health care before I came into the ministry and I'd never heard the word respite. It means to take a break from something hard or difficult, right? You better believe our families living with Alzheimer's and dementia, our caregivers, our people living with the disease, it is hard and it is difficult. And I believe it's the faith community that can create the space for us all to have a break, right? Every one of us that touches this ministry, for all of us to have a break. Um, this morning's scripture lesson comes from Acts 28, verses 1 through 2. The senior pastor that helped launch this ministry, Dr. Lawson Bryan, he became a bishop and has recently retired and back on my board, and we, we spread this vision all over the country. He's used this uh, passage to tell others, and I've, I've stolen it from him, but it's a, great, it's a great vision and a great story. In the last chapter of Acts, it tells of Paul's journey on a ship with 276 other prisoners. They were being taken to Rome to be presented to the emperor. They were in the rough seas, a storm comes along and shipwrecks their ship. Uh, the prisoners were all in the water and trying to find land and they, they make it to the shore. Here's the rest of the story though. They say in verse 28, after we had reached safety, we then learned that we were on the island of Malta. The local people showed us unusual kindness. Since it had begun to rain and everybody was frozen, they kindled a fire and they welcomed all of us around it. You get the picture? The day is cold and rainy. People are exhausted, they're broken, and they don't know where they are. 
I can tell you when you leave a neurology office and you hear the word Alzheimer's or dementia or Parkinson's or Lewy body or frontal lobe, did y'all know that there's 121 different types of dementia identified so far? There's never going to be a silver bullet. It's going to affect us all in some way or another, whether we're 28 or 24 or 7 or 82. We're going to know someone that's going to be living with us. It's just a part of life, right? This church is now the picture of that bonfire. You are the bonfire for these families. You've lit something so bright that they could come out of the darkness and they're going to be able to warm themselves. You're going to be able to warm yourselves. New ministry is contagious. It is full of people willing to help, and that's what you guys have put into motion, right? So during the day, when they come to our Vitality Respite, from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, I'm going to tell you what you need to know, because you guys, not all of you are going to be able to volunteer in this new ministry. Many are still working. Others have got ministries you're involved with. You've got other activities. But as a member of this church, when new ministry happens, you are charged with getting families that need to be in this program, with getting uh, volunteers, your neighbors, people. You've got to know the facts so you can tell the story, right? When you're in the grocery store and somebody, you can tell who needs to be here. You can say, hey, I want you to call I want you to call Vitality Respite. I want you to call St. Andrews and ask for Ginger. She's our director, and she's going to help you get set up. But anyway, from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, we're going to have art and music. We're going to have ball games and competition. I'm telling you, we are cut throat at respite. Everything goes, right? People come back to life before our very eyes. We also offer service projects. You know, we've got people that have built this community that have built this church, that have been on school boards and Kiwanis and Rotary and all the many civic organizations we've had, where do they go in their time of darkness? Where do they go when a lifetime changing diagnosis happens to them? Oftentimes people just self-isolate. They don't know what to do. They get embarrassed, right? They stay home. 50 year friendships become awkward. You don't know what to say. You don't know what to do. Casseroles are a good start. But I'm telling you, when your church can offer a space and a community for people to come back to life and thrive, not just survive, nobody wants to go to a neurologist's office and hear the words, you need to go home and rest. You need to get your affairs in order. You can't do that for 8 to 10 to 15 years. You still want to be part of the community. So this ministry... Uh, we train on how to do these service projects so people can still pack 50 diaper bags for young mothers, uh, pack backpacks for the school children, pack flood kits. We pack dog food and cat food for Meals on Wheels. Uh, we found that they were giving their food to their animals uh, at Christmas time. So our local place in Montgomery, y'all, we do it three times a year now. It's like the best service thing we do. It is such an opportunity for people to still have purpose, right? What a great gift. I just need you guys to know that I've listed off several things that we do between 10 o'clock and two o'clock, but it's really not about the art and it's not about the music. It's about the relationships. It's about the relationships. I'm telling you, our friend, um, We've got a couple, but my main friend is Jack and his wife, Mary. They're a part of our signature stories. I was telling the first services, I think this has spread because I'm a storyteller. I'm, I'm not a bright academic that goes around talking about uh, amyloid plaques and tangles and all the medicines we talk about with dementia. But I love to tell the stories of how I've seen people come back to life through the church, right? Our signature story is of a couple named Jack and Mary. Jack was about six foot four. He was a big old fella. He ran a chemical incinerator for the army in Anniston, Alabama, where I'm from. Brilliant guy. But he couldn't verbally talk. He had Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. His wife, Mary, didn't want to trust him to a kid she didn't know. This was 12 years ago. I was still maybe a kid. 
A lot of volunteers, she didn't know this wasn't their church. And so after two weeks, finally one of my volunteers said, Mary, you've got to go. We've got this. We've got this. Go, go on. I didn't know she said that. So Mary comes back in the room. Jack has still not spoken. It's been three weeks. We only have four participants growing slowly. Got about 12 volunteers. We're having this big ball game or something. Mary comes in and she says, Jack, Jack, I love you so much and I'm not deserting you. I'm not deserting you. I love you and I'll be back at two o'clock. I promise I'm not deserving you. I love you. I'll be back at two. And we all watched in amazement. And I know I was thinking, do I love my husband this much? I just, I just don't know that I do, right? I mean, people were crying. It was just beautiful. And all of a sudden, this big old fellow, after that tearful goodbye, he turns around and what does he say? Goodbye. <laughs> He's not spoken in three weeks. And he was in there. And you see, what we recognized was he needed a respite from her. We are not made to be together 24-7, right? And so why in the throes of this disease do caregivers just hover and they push everybody else away? And, you know, these two people are just melded all the time and he needed a break from her. And it helped us give language Caregivers don't want to bring their person out because they know they're living with a challenge and things might be different and it's kind of embarrassing. But when you can tell a caregiver, Mary, did you ever consider that maybe he needs his own group of friends? Maybe he needs some space from you, not in a bad way, but we just all need some space. It was a twofold story because she came back that afternoon, two o'clock for pickup. And I said, oh girl, what'd you do? Did you go to lunch? Did you go shopping? I mean, tell me what you did with your four hours. She said, oh, dear one. And she just wrapped me up. She said, I took my clothes off. I went home, put on my robe. I sat with a cup of coffee alone with my thoughts for the first time in three years. Because you see, when you get a break, you pay a caregiver to come and basically sit. If you're lucky, you've got somebody that cares, but you have to leave the house right? This ministry gives life to the person living with the disease, to the caregiver, and to the baby boomer volunteer that just needs a respite from the monotony of retirement. Where are you making a difference in someone else's lives, right? This church has taken the step to create that opportunity. I'm, I'm just so happy and proud for y'all. You've created a space where people can come and regroup, refocus, and reclaim joy that they never would have had going forward the next 15 years in this disease if it were not for this body of believers. That's what it means to start new ministry. I get really excited and I talk too much, so I've only got a couple more things to give you. But I just wanted you to know the growth of this ministry. As I said, it started with two people with dementia, 14 volunteers. At the beginning, it's really hard because people just don't understand what we're doing. You guys have got to talk to your neighbors. You got to talk to your golf group, to your men's breakfast club, to your Kiwanis people. You've got to make it okay for Mr. George to come when he's 72, when he's 68. You gotta say, hey man, we got, we got this retired group at the church. We've got veterans, family that, you know, uh, people that don't have family, we need you, we need you. Our training is not about medical procedures. Our training is how do we have language that says we need you? Oftentimes when we have Alzheimer's or dementia, you never hear those words again. How do we fill people up through the day that have meant so much to us, right? Our second signature story and what sets us apart is we all have the same name tags. And at the very beginning, I remember thinking, uh, I had people that would come up to me and say, well, how are we gonna know who's who? How are we gonna know who's got dementia and who's a volunteer? And I would say, oh, the beauty of this whole thing is we're all living with something. We've survived cancer, we're living with diabetes, we've survived wayward children financial woes, spiritual woes. 
why, why do we single out somebody that's got a memory problem? Who cares? We're all living with something, right? So our name tags are all the same. We just grow together. Well, I had a lady that came in. She was wearing overalls and a big straw hat one day with a big green tip till. I am telling y'all, she was a character. I really didn't know what to do with a drive-by drop-off dementia person because she just drove herself. She stayed all day. I didn't really know what to do. But when she was walking out the door, she turned around, she took her name tag off, and she said, dang, this is just better than AA. <laughs> and we thought, wow, okay. I said, what? what are you talking about? Tell me about that. What do you mean? And she said, nobody cares what my last name is. And you're all just meeting us where we are. How profound. Where in your life right now, it doesn't have to be an organized ministry. Where in your life right now are you meeting people where they are and you don't care what their last name is? Where's your embrace for the body of Christ, right? I want to tell you, if you're in this ministry, it is fun. It is joy. Nobody can imagine how hard we laugh. There are one-liners that will send you into hysterics. I think when people hear that this is a dementia ministry, they think of the long haul of the nursing home, and that's not the case. This is a social model, and that's what I want you to tell people in the community. Man, this is a ministry to combat isolation. There's no meds passed. There's no nurses there. This, this is just neighbor helping neighbor, right? This is salt of the earth stuff. I'm telling you, you guys are entering in to an interdenominational tidal wave. Seven denominations now, 11 states. We'll close at 40, I think, at the end of next month. And we've got grant money uh, coming from another source to hopefully start another 10 ministries across the country. And I've been invited to go to Australia to spread this volunteer model for not once, but the second time. This is a no-brainer. I'm 47 and 5 million people right now are living with Alzheimer's and dementia. In 30 years, when I'm 77, there'll be 15 million people living with Alzheimer's and dementia. There has to be new way forwards. I'm telling you, it's the church. There's different stages of this disease, but we're here to serve the early, the moderate, middle of the road, and we've got people on down the road. If you know one person with dementia, you know one person. Everybody is different. Just as... Just, as we tackle any other disease, right? But as I said, the hardest part is getting started. So it's your charge as the congregation to get people here. Um, you're just gonna invite them. You're gonna tell them to call Ginger at the church. It's as easy as that. And I've already told these two, their biggest problem is gonna be, this is gonna grow and it's gonna grow quickly because there is such a need. The two things I think that really keep us uh, growing in this ministry is A, it's transformational, but B, we make it really easy for families to join and volunteers to join. We've got a volunteer training tomorrow at nine o'clock in the morning until one, I think, if you'd like to come. It doesn't mean that you're signed up to work 52 Tuesdays. It means you're coming to learn more dementia education and how to have communication, right? Um, when you enter a volunteer pool, as opposed to signing up to 52 Tuesdays, it's a lot easier. I don't want you running from these two at the grocery store because you didn't show up on a Tuesday. We've got people that are here six months out of the year. We've got people that, you know, might work once a month. A lot of people work once a week. A lot of people, you know, work in the spring, work in the fall. When you're in a pool of people, it makes it so much easier, right? It's a, it's a neat concept. I want to close with this. We, uh, we have a dementia-friendly community chapel once a month, twice a month. And the hardest part of that is we, we go from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock, from 1.30 to 2. We offer worship, we offer songs, we sing, we pray together, but we gotta get a minister down to seven minutes. So I don't know if one of those two can do it, but we wanna be short and sweet. And we want people to be able to come when it's not a Sunday morning and rush traffic. But our associate, uh, we've had several in Montgomery over the years to just fall in love with respite. She wrote this closing paragraph in her thesis uh, for Duke University. 
I'd like to share it with you this morning. I think respite has ministered not only to people with mental dementia, but also people with spiritual dementia. What I mean by that is there are, of course, people who are clinically diagnosed with dementia who benefit from the ministry. The participants, many of ones who are isolated and alone, they find a sense of community and belonging. But there also seems to be a spiritual dementia that's being healed through respite. I so often hear volunteers speaking of joy and purpose and helping and being part of something so big and greater than themselves. I think respite has helped not only participants, but also volunteers to remember, right? What it feels like to have purpose, passion, joy, and community. And sometimes to feel that for the very first time. So I invite you to be part of Vitality because I'm telling you, you're gonna have people from all over the state coming to this church to find out how to do new ministry, right? I invite you to the training tomorrow if you'd like to come and just learn. You don't have to stay the whole time, we'll take you. But there'll be opportunities to help all, all through the year, whether it be lunches or volunteer uh, hospitality things. There's, there's so many ways to enter. But you guys, you're the ones bringing the wood to build the bonfire. And it's going to be bright. It's going to be warm for all of these families living in the darkness. Thank you.